Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath once again. We are so grateful to be here with all of you this afternoon. And we want to wish a happy Sabbath to all our viewers, wherever they are watching us from. And we, indeed, we have been blessed by the messages that have um, been preached to us throughout the week. And with me here is the final piece of the program, the panel discussion, to just give it the final push of what we have been learning. I don't want to repeat what has gone through the week. We had very, very powerful speakers all the way from our prayer breakfast on Sunday until today where our elderess and leader of the Adventist Women Ministries New Life, Sister Gladys Njuguna, spoke to us about Jesus and his love. And we see, if you go back to the week, we see that each and every speaker spoke about the outward. They spoke about how Jesus loves us. They spoke about us loving the difficult people. They spoke about Jesus modeling love to us. Today we want to go back to basics. We want to go back to you and I and God. We want to go back to basics and ask ourselves, what is God talking about loving me? Because we have seen loving one another. We have seen how Jesus has modeled his love for us. But today we want to find out, how do we love me? How do we love God so that then we are able to love our neighbor. And to, to this afternoon's topic will be emotionally mature and holistic transformation. Emotionally mature and holistic transformation. And before I introduce the panel, I'd like to request that Sister Vane prays for us. Sister Vane. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon again. Just turn to your, to your neighbor and say hi. And you do it with love. Please do it with love. Some of you are just throwing words. Just do it with love. Hi. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come to you this afternoon. Thanking you, Father, for the masses that you have kept showering us with. Thank you, Father, even for the gift of this day, the Sabbath that you created and sanctified. And blessed, and Father, that is why we are being blessed all through. This week, Father, we have heard about your love, our love to you. And this afternoon, Father, we want to crown it all, Father. May the panel that has prepared to come and talk to your children, Father, may they speak that which you have given them to speak. Father, may you give them clear mind and the presentation, Father. May the woman who is in this home, in this house, Father, who has not been loving the way they should, may they know that it is a command from you. May the man who is in this house father who has not loved the family the way they should may they learn from this one week and even the crowning today father may we love our children may we love our neighbors may we learn to love all those who are around us father and first of all father may we love you as we love ourselves and as we love our neighbors father Open the minds of each one of us, Father, even as we start sharing this. And Father, when we leave this compound today, may it be a week that we are going to celebrate throughout our lives. May we just be singing about the love that we have learned 
And may everybody will be seeing us, Father, see that love that we have learned throughout this week. Be with us, Father, now even as we start this session until the end. Bless each and everyone we see, our Father, as we continue with this program. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Sister Vane, for that prayer. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to request uh, my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, beginning from my left-hand side. Good afternoon. My name is Vila Magati, a member of this church, and I love the Lord, and I can testify of his goodness in, his, in my life. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath. My name is Emily Okuku. I love the Lord. Um, I'm also a member of this church, a mother of three adult children, and I'm also a counseling psychologist. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon again. My name is Ven Lumumba. I'm a member of this church. I love the God we serve because he loves us. Thank you and be ready to receive the love. Amen. Happy Sabbath. My name is Becca Moyo. I'm a member of this church. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nkatha Ogutu, a member of this church. Now, um, there's a book that was written by Peter Sakazero and the title is Emotionally Healthy Spiritually. And he states that it does not matter how anointed or how much of the Bible you know. And he says that in the indispensable element to say that you have reached maturity is love. The indispensable element to say that you have reached maturity is love. And we ask ourselves, what is spiritual maturity? And he goes on to say that spiritual maturity is um, a Christian who reflects the character of Jesus Christ. And we know very well that maturity is something that happens over time. It is growth that happens over time. And at the very, very core, of spiritual maturity is becoming who God created each one of you to be. You know, developing your own capabilities as a child of God and embracing your uniqueness. And we ask ourselves, then how then can I be transformed? Because the theme of this week is a love that transforms. And we ask ourselves, how can we be transformed by love in order to reach the spiritual maturity without neglecting our own emotional health? And we see that Christ, in the Gospel of Mark uh, 12, 28 to 31, he gives the two greatest commandments. And the first greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he says that the second commandment, second greatest commandment, is to love your neighbor as to love yourself. And he finalizes and says, there are no greater commandments than this. And so today we want to see and we want to dissect each of these commandments so that we are able to understand what does it mean to love God with all our hearts, our souls, our mind, our strength. And when it comes to the second one, how then are we supposed or how then can we ensure that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? So the panel today will help me um, to dissect these two uh, commandments 
And we will start with loving God with all our hearts. And I'll ask my sister Vila to demonstrate to us or to explain to us what is it, what does it mean to love God with all our hearts? Vila. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, loving God with all your heart means that you're placing him at the center of your life. It means uh, allowing his, life, his love to transform you. It also means that you're obeying his commandments. It means you're seeking his will. It means you're serving him with a humble and uh, grateful heart. It means you're developing a personal relationship with God. And you can do this through prayer, through worship, through studying his word. Uh, but you can see it's uh, becoming a bit difficult now to, you know, to love God with all your heart because we have, we have so many things that are coming in the way of our love for him. We find that we have distractions that are coming in. We find that we are busy with our everyday lives. We find that we have challenges that are causing us to not even be able to seek um, him and to even have a relationship with him. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Villa. Now, a lot of us confuse loving God with all your heart and loving God with all your soul. And those are actually two very different parts. And as we continue to dissect this um, commandment, we ask Sister Rebecca, what does it mean? What's the difference between loving God with all your heart and with your soul? Uh, thank you. Uh, this part of the great commandment reminds us to love our Heavenly Father with all our soul. And this is explained uh, very well by David in Psalms 42, verse 1 to 2. And my sister Glad is also titled it this morning. And I'll read in your hearing, As the deer panteth for streams of water, so my soul panteth to, for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Why did David choose this animal called a deer? Uh, it is said that when temperatures rise, the deer's need for water increases. And the deer loses water through urine, through droppings, and through breath, uh, breathing, because when it breathes, it will be painting. It is believed that this animal will seek for water after being chased or hunted, it actually panteth or cries for water, knowing that its, its survival depends on the water. If the deer was to run for too long from an enemy and fails to locate water, it is said that it collapses and dies. So besides quenching its thirst from water, the deer also finds safety and protection from the water because this animal can swim, so it can hide from enemies in the water. And also its scents get distracted by the water, so the enemy won't be able to trace it. Again, when the deer gets injured, its natural response is to go to the water again. Somebody might say, uh, the deer is too far-fetched. Maybe let's talk about the yellow plant, the sunflower. The sunflower turns towards the sun at all times throughout the day. Starting the day facing east and ending the day facing west. Let us also focus and incline unto the Lord the whole day. So going back to what David wrote in Psalms 42, verse 1 and 2, he says, Lord, so my soul painted after you, even in the most desperate hours. David turned to the Lord. He longed for the Lord. He sought the Lord and worshipped the Lord. Therefore, to love God with all your soul, is to love God with all that we are, to find our inner self inclining toward God, to seek God and to keep him as the center of our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Rebecca. Indeed, we see that he panteth for the water. 
It hides itself in the water when it's hot. It hides itself in the water when um, the enemies are running after it. It's just the same way that we hide our soul in the Lord. When we are hurting, we hide our soul in the water. When we are uh, running away from the enemies, we hide our souls in the water. When we want to refresh ourselves, we hide our souls in the water. Now, we want to look at how do we love God with all our minds. And I want to invite our mentor champion to talk to us about the mind, Sister Emily. Thank you, Sister Emma. Loving God with our mind. Loving God with our mind. All of us, at, even at this point, you're thinking about something. What is in your thought? Where is your mind? Where is it stayed? Is it in God or is it in the things of the world? So when you're looking at loving God with our mind, we are looking at our thoughts. Can we take our thoughts captive? Our mind stayed in the Lord. We are looking at our feelings our thoughts, and our emotions. So when you're looking at your thoughts, for example, what is it that you think about your neighbor, for example, the one who is next to you? And we are talking about love today. Do you love your neighbor? Think about that. Reflect on that. Even as we are looking at the thinking of um, loving God with our minds, it means what we think about God, what are our thoughts about God. Who is God? What do we think about God? Maybe today you had a, a, a tough day. What did you think about God? Do you think he's a loving God? So what we are looking at, when we're looking at love, loving God with our mind, it means our minds are stayed on God, on his holiness, his goodness, his mercy, and his grace, without which we cannot even be here. So we're looking at the love, loving God with our minds. As we love God, do we love our neighbors? And God says, before you love, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. What about yourself? Do you love yourself? Just think about it even now. How much do you love yourself? What thoughts do you have about yourself? Do you have positive thoughts about yourself? Someone may tell you something. I was talking to someone yesterday and they were saying, telling me that someone had called them um, a, a young boy and a friend had called him a dog. And when he went home, he was crying. So the mother asked him, why are you crying? And he said, someone has called me a dog. And the mother caned him, caned him and told him, look at your back. Do you have a tail? And he said, no. So she said, then why are you crying? Are you a dog? So what we think about ourselves, our thoughts about ourselves, our thoughts about our neighbors. What do you think about your neighbor? And thoughts are not true. Thoughts cannot be true unless you can prove. Maybe you're thinking someone doesn't like, like you. Is it true? It may not be true. If I pass you here today, it does not mean that I don't like you. Maybe I didn't see you. But now our thoughts come in and it starts telling us that Becky doesn't like me. So the next time I meet Becky, I also pass. So let's take our thoughts captive. So loving God means loving God for who he is. Loving yourself for who you are. You are created in God's image. You are blessed and highly favored. So those thoughts should stick to your mind. And also loving your neighbor as you love yourself. So basically thinking about the thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions, and using that to the glory of God. So that at this point, when you think about your neighbor who has been unwell, and you go visit them, those are kind thoughts. You're serving God with your mind, because you're thinking about someone who is not in a position to even come in to church. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Emily, for that. Um, I'd actually not looked at it that way, but coincidentally, this week we have been um, speaking with a friend of mine, and you know, when you go through a situation, and especially a tough situation, when you're in the boat and there's a storm, you know, what are your thoughts about God? I know our preacher today said, think of the bigger picture, 
that you are crossing to the other side. But sometimes, what are your thoughts about God at that time? Do you think he's a loving God at that time? Do you think he's with you? So it is very important that we look at our thoughts. Our sister Vain will now highlight what is it, Vain? What does it mean to love God with all our strength? Thank you, thank you, Emma. We have had the first three components of loving God through your heart, through our soul, and through our mind. And these are the inward ways of showing God love. That love which you have in you, you have seen it through the three. And so now we want to see how we love God with all our strength. Our strength, you can't even be sitting there because you have to show that strength. And that strength is outward. So this number four shows us that we have to come out and show God love through that which he, give, he gave us. From head to toe, the physical part of it, how do you use your whole body to love God, your whole strength? So, if we start with you, we can see you have a head. So this head, you have to apply some energy to show that you have used it to love God. You have to show God through this mouth that you love. You know, there has to be energy. Becky will be singing here until she closes her eyes. You know, you can see the energy she puts in praising God with her mouth. You know, it is your energy. And you can't just be there and you are saying you are praising God and loving him with your strength. There has to be action, some energy put into you praising and loving God. And we are also told you can use your hands. You know, the, the strength has to come from your hands for you to work and help the people God has put in your life for you to have used that energy and the strength. And God gave you those people around you because you will have to use your hands and that is action. You have to be a doer of the word for you to love God and he will appreciate. Yes, he gave you two hands and you have used to love him through serving those around you. You have to use your feet to reach out to those who want to be reached or those who have not heard the word. And when you go out, you are going for a mission and we were told in the morning, you can't be seated and say you are serving God by being in a new life, 5th Ngong Avenue, 4th Ngong Avenue, and say you have loved God by doing what? Sitting on the same chair from January to January. How can it be? When we look, I love this song 330, take my life and let it be. You know, Becky, let, let's sit, sing just one stanza, the number three. Just hear those words and see whether you fall in those words. Becky. My lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not am I to die withhold, not am I to die withhold. Thank you. Take my voice. You sing, you will sweat when you are singing. But if you don't sweat, then you are not even putting any energy. For this one, God is saying, love him with your strength. And so with your strength, you have to use your mouth, your lips to sing. And to sing like you are singing and you mean it. And so when we see 
that and we are told even the messages you are taking out mm -hmm. you have to go out and share those messages you have the good news that you have had go out and tell others about the goodness of god and god will be seated somewhere and saying yes i gave her hands and mouth and the mind and the feet and she's using it to praise me and to love me and there there is a might you use your resources we are told that you need to work for your resources and get that resource out so that it can serve God. And when it serves God, it means you are loving him through acting through your resources. In your office, you can be a resource of what God has given you. Use all the gifts that he has given you to love God. Some of us sit with our resources. God gave us a gift to use so that we use that energy to come out and love God. But we are seated, it's like nimutoto throughout. That cannot work well because God does not want that. Here it is. If you work, work so hard, like this man, in the morning we were talk, told about Asoka, Asendo and Manchester, that is okay. Now we have another one called Mani from Senegal. This man had, he loved soccer. And nobody knew what he was earning and what he was getting from that soccer. This man worked and played his soccer bare feet because he was so poor. He came from a very humble background. So he played so well that he became a star. And this man, when you could see his phone, Yako Ikosawa, when you could see his phone, the screen is broken, you know, So his fans used to make fun. Sasa, now how can this man surely, how can he be walking around with such a phone? Then you know what he said? This is what he said. This man was earning US dollars. 10.2 million a year. What can you do with 10? Not buying a phone? At least you can buy. But this man was not interested in that phone which you think he, uh, he should have had. This is what he saw when people kept asking him. He said, I starved. I worked in the fields when raining and with, with, I mean when shining I played bare feet and I did not go to school apparently didn't even go to school now I can help my people build schools, stadiums give shoes which I never play, play, played with but I can afford to buy a shoe and give that boy who wants to play soccer and he concluded by saying I prefer that my people receive a little of what life has given me and what God has blessed me with. May God bless each one of us as we think of how we are loving God with all that he has blessed us with. Think about it. Are you using that which you are given to love God? Think about it even when you live here. Is it something that you have never thought about? Of course you have thought about it, but are you making use of that? Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Elder S. Vain. That's a very, very powerful testimony indeed. And just to echo the words of uh, um, President Obama, one time he came to Kenya and he asked us, even if you have 10 houses, how many can you live in at the same time? Even if you have a mansion that has 10 bedrooms, how many can you sleep in at one time? And so to this footballer who is a star, even if he has all the money, how many phones can he speak to with at one time? And so he has chosen to give back to his community what he did not have. Sometimes many of us, what we did not have when we get, 
we become gluttonous. May we remember the words of uh, Sister Vane this afternoon to be able to use our strength. Indeed, by loving God with all our strength means that we use all that we have and all that we are to honor him and to honor other people. And I want us to transition to the second commandment. And this commandment is loving yourself. And it is love your, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And you're asking, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of uh, talk about self-love. Self-love in the media, in social media. And sometimes as Christians, we have been told that that is paganism. That when you come and say self-love, it is paganism. But I want to correct that notion because it is right here in the Bible. It is a, Jesus said this is the second greatest commandment. That you love your neighbor as you love yourself. But the question is, can you truly, truly love God and your neighbor if you do not love yourself? Can you? Can you truly, truly love God and your neighbor if you do not love yourself? May I ask Emily to tell us, what is it? What, what's the meaning of loving yourself? Sister Emily. Thank you, Sister Emma. God is love. And since God is love, we are also love because we are made in his, in his image. And love is a choice. God chose to send his son to die for us. So it's a choice. So for you to love yourself, you have to deliberately choose that. The Bible says love your neighbor as you love, ourself, as you love yourself. You can't give what you don't have. So first of all is to take care of yourself before you can take care of someone else. In Proverbs 4.23, um, I, I will just paraphrase, but you need to pay attention to, to the welfare of your innermost being. From there flows the wellsprings of life. So loving yourself, it means taking a t uh, paying attention to your inner self. Who are you? What do you say to yourself? What do you think about yourself? There are many times when, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I could just ask all of you, when was the last time you felt your heart beating? Just put your hand on your chest. When was the last time you felt your heart beating? You just, normally we just wake up and we are going. We wake up and, you know, you, you just go through the motions. I'm going to work Monday to Friday. On Saturday, I'm coming to church. When did you stop to think, who am I? Is my heart beating? The, the basic, basic, you know. So being able to have positive talk about yourself. When you get a negative feeling about yourself, what do you say to yourself? That today I am sad, yeah? What is it that we can do to change that thought? Always we are encouraged to use the opposite, having positive uh, self-talk. That if someone told you something and you know yourself very well, it's not about what someone is telling you. It's about what you're telling yourself. I just gave an illustration of a dog. We are not dogs. And if someone called you a dog and you know for sure, you know yourself. And that's where self-love is coming from you're not going to act as a dog. That mama told the son to look at his back and there was nothing. And he was told, may I never hear you crying here that someone has told you that. How about you? If someone called you a dog, what would you do? You'd start barking, isn't it? <laughs> How can you call me a dog? I'm not a dog. Uh, uh, how can you even say that, you know? And you start abusing them, literally. And what do you become? A dog, because you're barking. So you're qualifying what they're saying. So what is it that you think about yourself? Who are you? Do you know yourself? Are you self-aware? 
Can you stand and say, this is who Emily is? That it doesn't matter what someone is saying about you because God, what does God say about you? What does God say about you? What does, you don't even know what God says about you. That which the Bible say, yeah? Yo, Emma. Fearfully and wonderfully Fearfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. So sometimes you don't have to struggle. You don't have to. You know who you are, and therefore you stand tall. Because God has qualified you. God has qualified you because of his love. And the expectation is to receive. To receive and to live that which the Bible say. Proclaim the Bible verses. What does God say about me? I love you because he loved you. He gave his only begotten son that through him you are saved. And therefore, who can bogo you? Nobody. So you first must know yourself and then you can be able to stand tall and say, this is who I am and therefore it doesn't matter what someone has said. So loving yourself is being self-aware, is claiming those promises in the Bible and knowing that you are a child of God, that whatever or whatever happens to you, you still remain a child of God, that God has called you and God has qualified you and therefore nothing, absolutely nothing can change that. So that is what we are talking about today, that do you know yourself? If you know yourself, then nothing else will be will distract you from appreciating who you are and always talking positively about yourself. Talking positively with conviction. With conviction. Because you know and you know for sure that what you're convicted about it is what you actually are. Thank you. Amen to that. Amen to that. And as Sister Emily has said, God has called you and he has qualified you. So we are unbogable, right? We are unbogable. Now, uh, there was a documentary about a young girl who unfortunately was found dead by the roadside. And uh, they tried to get her identity. And the story goes that unfortunately, the place that she was seen last and where she worked, that was not her identity. And they tried to trace it until, and she had so many identities. And finally, um, they found where she had been born and where she was abducted. But can you imagine dying without knowing who you truly are, you know? This girl had been born somewhere uh, was abducted, uh, was raised by different parents, was then uh, taken to another home, was abused, gave birth to a child, you know, with somebody that she didn't even know. And eventually she died, died not knowing who she was. And sadly, we sometimes may go through life not knowing who our true selves are. And We can go through life in our false self. But I want to ask Sister Vain to to demystify how we can recognize that false self. Sister Vain. Thank you. False. You know, God created us and made sure that he didn't create uh, copies. You were created an original. But as we have grown up, we have tried to make ourselves be different people. And it is through that that even scholars have found it important to go and do research and see why people are behaving different from when, what they were created to be. So when we talk about false self. Do you remember when in school you could find some kids fighting? Then moja na songesha sweta jua na sema leo utanijua mi ni nani? 
What does that mean? It means they have been together, but they have never known whom he was. Eh? Until this day that they are fighting in the field, is when he is going to see whom he is really. What does that mean? It means that this man or boy has been wearing a different mask from what he is or what he has been. So, we get that because of being different in the way we have lived, we have got even new terms, like now, this false self. You know, false self. You know, when you talk about it first, you are saying, false self, how? But this is what this false self is. It means you, you are false. You are pretending to be what you are not. God created A, you are pretending to be C. Pretending to be what we are not. We are living a life of lying. That is why it is false self. And this is a definition from those scholars who have done their research and found that many a times we are faking to be what we should be so that we are somebody else or something else. We are authentic, we are fake. We are wearing false personalities. Our characteristics are portraying somebody else. And we are wearing a fashion which is not us. That is serious. And you know what they are saying? That most of us are wearing this fakeness or this false self. Yani wewe ukwenye umeketi unasema huyo sio mimi tumeambiwa na wasomi all of us are wearing something fake making somebody else see us differently how is this coming up it's coming up from our childhood when we were growing up we were young and we were growing up we found that there is something which we did with our parents which sometimes could make them favor us, do for us things because of us wearing that fakeness. You wanted a sweet or you wanted to be taken somewhere, you will come smiling to your parents. Oh, mom, I love you. You love me because you want what? You know, because I want to be taken somewhere, because I want a, sh a, a sweet, because I want a new shoe. And as a parent, we entertained that without knowing this will in the future have an impact on our children and even on us. So you go and smile nicely, you bring water from outside, you know, you've never brought that water, but this day, because you want a favor, ama mukufanya ivo, wengine wana smile, ninaona wenye walifanya ivo. Yani, you want to do nice things so that you can get something. So you grow up until you get to even church or school whereby you are faking to be you, the one you are supposed to be, the one God created you to be, so that you can fit into a certain group. Kuna ile group ilikuwa inajulikana shule, sindio? That group, even in church, there is that group you want to be associated with. So you fake, you fake or you present your, your false self, covering yourself with a different uh, fashion so that you can be accepted in that group. So you grow up even up to your workplace. Kuna watu kwa kazi, unaona, because of promotion, they have to present themselves. Yani wanapenda mudos mbaka promotion ikija lazima watapewa. Mumewai kuwasikia? At least for me, I know I saw. Kumbe, it is false self. You are not the one. You just are doing that so that you can get that favor. And imagine now that has become a disorder. Because unaji pendekeza sana so that you can get so we are told 
that has gone to workplaces, that has gone even to our careers. When you want to get something, you go out and fake it until you get it. So why is it that there is this self? Why false self? We do it so that we can be accepted amongst our peer. We can be loved. Even the parents, when the children were wearing that false version, there is that wanting to love them. And that has been documented that it is true. And so that is why somebody grows knowing, I have to do this so that I'm loved. So that you belong. You belong to a certain class. So that you cover your shame. You want to wear it so that, uh, Yanni, uh, you normally walk barefoot because you didn't have, but sasa you unaomba kiatu for one hour so that you cover that shame. That is what we mean. So you want to do all possible things so that you don't deal with the shame. Instead, you deal with that which you are not. You want to avoid the pain of embarrassment and you want to look good. To those you want to join their group or you want them to accept you, you want to be good and for you to be good, you have to fake. Emma, imagine you fake. <laughs> and that is where you find somebody say, yes, utanijua. So, you wait for you to know the person. And for sure, kuna true colors, yenye mutu wanasema, yenye sasa tumemujua. Go and get somebody quarreling in their mother tongue. That is when you will know their true colors. It means what we have been seeing was different from what the person is really. Let them not quarrel in English. English, the words may not come out well. But let them quarrel in vernacular. That one you will know who you to memujua through colors. So you find that we, in life we have lived that. And why do we do this? We also have found that some of us will do this imagining that that is how life has, is supposed to be. We have grown knowing if you work hard, you will get a lot of money and you will be comfortable. That is not natural. You have known that I am beautiful and so I am likable. So the likable will not be your natural. Do you know that? So you, you are like, I want to be because I want to be liked. So you will find many wanting to be beautiful by doing all sorts of things so that they are liked. And we are also told that some will want to do it so that uh, they can be comfortable. But that is still making cosmetics out of your life. And so, why do we do this? Eh? I mean, what are the signs? And that is what the, the title is telling us. Recognize. How do you recognize this? And what is the implication of that? The signs of this are, most of the time you will feel you are inadequate. Why are you inadequate? Remember you are faking so that you can police this group. So you see you will be doing something you don't know, you are not sure whether you have reached the standard of that group. And so you will strain to do the best so that they can accept you in that group. So it means you are feeling inadequate and so when you feel inadequate because of being in a group or with people, no, recognize your false self from that day. You are editing your words or behavior. Tomorrow you know you are meeting this group. Usiku yote utakuwa una edit your version. So that tomorrow when you wake up, you are fitting into that group. Iyo sini punishment bila malipo. You know, you, you are working so hard. Unavaa inguo, unaona sasa hii hata itatokea. You know, you change. Even you are English, you want to change. Be natural, my sisters and my brothers. You know, when you are natural, you come out na unaenda na inaisha. Lakini this one of kujipamba inakuwa ngumu because then you are wasting your time. You, are, you, you, you even become stressed. Because by the time you leave that group, you are going to ask yourself, did I meet the standards? 
and you want to even ask, how did I perform? And yet you are doing fake things, you are pretending to be that which you are not. And remember we have been told, all of us are victims. All of us. There is something you do. It may not be like hers or mine, but there is something you are doing. Please go and think about it, but we'll be told by our other speaker. The other one is, you will keep watching yourself. When you are wearing that false self outfit, you will keep watching yourself. Yani unaji, nimefanya hivyo, you know, kujifuruta furuta. Unajifuruta nini na mungu alikuumba sawa. You are not a, no, a copy, you are an original the way you are. You are beautiful the way you are. And it is said, we are never the same. Even twins are never the same. So kwa nini unajifuruta furuta watching that, eh, ameniona. When you pull out some nice vocabulary, you think now somebody has had, and now you are fitting into the group. That is fakeness. And that is false self. You want to come out to be what you are not. Then, the other bit of recognizing is when you come and find that you are empty. You know, in the evening you will go back after all that drama and the exercise of wanting to be, unafika kwa nyumba, you find that iso nguo unansa kuzitupa hapa ata ujui whether you performed or you didn't perform. Yani inakuwa misery. So you find you are empty, you go to sleep, you are not even sure. The five members in that, did they even acknowledge that I did something? Now you are not even sure. So you become empty. You become inadequate. The moment you find that coming into you, and you are thinking about it, there is something which you need to look at so that you can amend that uh, uh, practice. You also become inconsistent. Sindio? Lea unasema sema, yes sir, yes sir. Ukikasirika, ulikuwa unasema nini? In a change. So, somebody wonders, this man has, the, all this month, has been calling me sir or madam, all of a sudden, I'm a change, I can say, at you can say, so it means you are not consistent because you are wearing a false self. Ebu ambia rafiki yaka hapa mmeketi na yeye, do I have a false self in me which you can see? Ebu murize, just ask, maybe they have seen something. Yes, and on that bit, in concluding that bit, we want to see, yes, we are false, and we accept we have an element of falseness or fakeness in us, in the way we behave. This brings bad, uh, I mean, in life, it comes out, and people miss to trust you because of that. An example is in marriage. Of course, I, I am bringing it in because it is the best example that was given. When you reach a point where you are getting married, na kam kijana kana kude TV, waze sasa hiyo siyo yenu, ni wale wasichana na wavulana hivi, you find that the girls and the boys really wear this false uh, self. They wear it totally from head to toe. From the way that they talk, the way they present themselves, the way they do their things, you, the, your bag as a girl will be carried. Even your shoes, if it is raining, they will carry for you. You can be sure. Wait. Wait until you are in that marriage. At, even the obvious one will not be done for you. So then you find, sasa sikiatu uliko na beba vile uliko na nyo, ile bagi su beba tu vile uliko na beba, vitu ime change, carry your things. That is where now trouble starts. Then you find munakosana until you don't know what to do. And that is why the old ones can survive because them wanajua hii side ama hii side. But the young ones, they wear it and they think it should be worn throughout, that fakeness. So wanaenda kungoja, huyu mutu siyalikuwa nasema, eh, 
anasema asanti how, how are you baby hakuna hizo vitu siku hiyo zinaisha mtu anachoka so it is good we are told it's good to recognize your false self early enough why so that you don't go and practice it where it is not supposed to be used so that you don't bring it out and people will be wondering what you exactly mean so when you understand kuna ile ile hiyo rationing because we have been told everybody has so know yours so that you can help yourself and those around you to try and understand you so that they don't step on your toe so may you invite god into your life so that he can show you because for some they don't know may god show you that false selfness in you so that at least you get to know it and you know how to act and treat those around you whether you are removing the mask or wearing when you see a certain situation may god bless you thank you so so much um sister vain um what on to you if uh, you are wearing one self in one crowd and, uh, and the other crowd also showed up you know so if uh, you are in the crowd where you are polishing your english and the other crowd that knows that uh, english is not your tongue you know the war on to you thank you so much sister vain for that now she has really elaborated why it is that we wear a false self and our preacher today sister gladys pointed out that women are fake but indeed we have seen from what sister vain has shared it's not just women it is all of us it is all of us and to the young people who are out there who are hoping to get married it is advisable that you court at least for a year so that angalau your fake mask yanguke kidogo sawa sawa so we want to move on to how then because we have now seen we have our false self how do we get rid of that false self sister rebecca uh, thank you very much thank you my sister for elaborating on the false self um, how do we get rid of false self? I just want to emphasize back that false self is actually false personality. And what exactly are we going to get rid of? Okay, so the writer mentioned three things. The first one, she says uh, we need to get rid of the cells which, have been, which we have been logged into. My sister was giving me an example recently. She said, you know, as a society, we expect everyone in the 30s to have been married, one, two, to have a career, three, to be a successful person in life and to own a house or some other properties, assets. So she says, uh, it's my cousin, she reached 35. She only had a diploma in HR. She looked for a job, she couldn't find a job. And the society was very ugly with her. People kept on poking her. What are you still doing? What are you doing in life? Are you for real? At your age, you are not married. You don't have employment. There's nothing that you can do. She says she really lived a difficult life. And then it so happens that the former classmates um, organized an association. So she became a member of that association. So she says when she got there, others had become doctors, others had become teachers, you know, you name it and you name it, and others were businessmen. And she was the only one. She was the only one who had nothing to show. So she says she felt out of place and she also wanted to show them that at least I can contribute something. So when it came to functions as an association, she would borrow money. Not only money, she would borrow clothes to put on when she goes for those functions. False self, 
It has been created by the society. And remember what causes this false self. It's early. What causes the false self is an early and repeated failure in life, which means we also need to manage our failures in life. And we also need to encourage those that are failing in life. If you see somebody who is in the 30s, but still struggling in life, we need to take action, not in the negative, of trying to poke them, to say, what are you still doing? At your age, how can you look at your neighbors? So I hope we'll take this into consideration. So the writer says, we need to get rid of these cells that we have created as a society, as a church, and as a family. And then secondly, she says we have put masks on, right? These masks are for external validation. Do you know that some choices that we make, we need validation from our family members, we need validation even from the church. We need validation from the social media. We need validation from the culture. And we need validation from the society. We need to get rid of this. And thirdly, she says, we need to try and get rid of that desire to conform to the people that are around us, whereby we are showing different sides of ourselves to different people in our lives. I think my sister touched on it. Okay, so the results of self, uh, of false self, are that we stop loving others, fearing they will not love us back. We stop going to others for support, fearing they will refuse to help us. We stop saying what we think because someone used our words to hate or condemn us. We isolate ourselves from others. Our false self sometimes pushes us to tell lies, to get what we want and pretend to be someone which we are not. So the attitudes that we see that are developed from false self include self-protection, passiveness, manipulation, self-indulgence, and the need to distinguish ourselves from others. As my sister said earlier, we need to be real, we need to be genuine, and we need to be authentic. But how do we do this? We thank God because God has got a solution of getting rid of the false self. And for us to get rid of the bad traits of character, we need to confess our sins. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is only when we are in a close relationship with God that we will discover our true selves. Find your own identity. Find greater love for others and be transformed. We need to be living consistently in the presence of God to live genuine lives. You know, the social media especially has turned us into false self in many ways and in different ways and especially for our children as well. May God help us to turn to him so that we are real, we are genuine before him and before others. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Rebecca. You know, it is amazing how we are very quick to judge and to look at a graph that has been given by society that by 30 I should be here, by 40 I should be here. Who gave us that graph? Who ordained that graph? I want to echo the words of um, a famous preacher in the US, uh, Priscilla Schreier. And she says, if you are going to die at 50, if you are 30 years old, you're extremely old. If you are going to die at 70, if you are 40 years, you are extremely young. So let us not judge how much one has acquired or what degrees or the number of houses. Our graphs are different because God has created us, each and every one of us, 
for a different purpose and a different path. I want to move to Sister Villa and ask her, now that we have recognized and we've gotten rid of our false self, how do we live our true self? Sister Villa. Um, my sisters here have all touched you know, a bit on how you can live your true self. Living your true self requires uh, self-awareness, it requires self-acceptance, it requires self-love. So you need to be able to incorporate all that to be able to live your true self. It means you need to embrace your uniqueness. Most of the time we don't embrace our, our uniqueness. And um, I love the scripture that uh, Emily quoted, and that's um, my children love it as well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows very well. So you need to be able to recognize that. You need to have self-awareness. We talk about self-awareness, you know, abstractly, and, and um, you know, and today we've seen that it actually originates from the word of God. We all need to be self-aware. We are all carrying some traumas from childhood that are, you know, making us not live our true self. Um, I have two children, um, Jaden, who's four, and uh, Eliana, who's five. And we have two totally different personalities. All of us are a bit laid back, aside from my son, who's an extrovert. So we are trying to deal with an extrovert in the family. But we have to learn to, you know, embrace and teach them their uniqueness. If you sit, we see someone in that corner, my son will ask all the questions, you know. And, and the latest is um, because we have been talking about death he's talking about mommy why did your mom die it's always a question every sabbath where is your mom where why did she die why all those questions my, my daughter is a bit laid back but you can see her uniqueness and her personality and so all of us are different in our own ways so we, when you recognize that you're able to embrace that and if you're bringing up a teenager you know um, uh, teaching them to live their true self is a bit of a challenge now because now they're comparing themselves with um, other students. They are now kind of aware of where they are. They're not embracing where they are. They are embarrassed probably from where they are. They'll probably not be saying where they stay uh, and such kind of things. And therefore, because of that, they'll probably develop other habits like bring kleptos and, you know, so that they can be able to fit in and go and show other people how they are also the same. And so we, all of us need to have self-awareness, meaning that you need to recognize your strengths, your weaknesses. It means you need to recognize who you are, how, uh, and recognizing all that means you're going to live your true self and the way God intended you to be. It means you can be able to take a pause when you know things are not going well because you know yourself now. You know uh, things that are triggering you emotionally. You know um, and uh, it's reminding me two years ago I decided to step back from my workplace because I had gone through you know, health challenges and my children were very young and it was not, you know, all those things um, uh, working when you're working with, when you're dealing with uh, post-traumatic post, uh, postnatal <laughs> stress, you're dealing with all those things, and COVID is all coming in. And so, when you become self-aware, it means you now have to recognize where does my strength come from, where does my providence come from? Um, because if I decide and if I recognize that my providence is coming from God. It means I'll be able to make decisions about my life that will enable me to live my true self and become the person that God intended me to do, to be. It means that I know um, I will not hang in there wherever it will be um, because I, uh, whichever way I'm getting, it is paying my bill, it is doing this, it's making me, you know, uh, the story that you're telling us, it will make me uh, fit in in a society at the end of the day, you find that you're mentally exhausted because you're not living your true self. You have to fit in. You have to be someone who you are not. 
So when you become self-aware of yourself, it means you'll be able to now see oh, uh, what do I need to do as a person to enable me to live a fulfilling life? Do I need to exercise? Do I need to eat right? Do I need to, you know, what do I need to do? And when you recognize that, then you're able to live your true self without any baggage, and you will be the person God intended you to be. Wow. Amen. Thank you so, so much, Sister Villa. I want us to hold out our hand. Can you hold out your hand? Do your, does your thumb equal your index finger? Does it? Does the little finger equal the middle finger? Just as your fingers are different, every, each one of us is very unique. The eye cannot hear. The feet cannot touch. So therefore, as Sister Villa has said, when you embrace your true self, you look at what are my weaknesses? What is it I can be able to do? What can't I do? Who then can help me with what I cannot do? And that way, we are able to fulfill what God's purpose for us in our lives is. We want to ask Sister Emily to now look at how then, because we have seen our true self, how do we emotionally, how do we live emotionally healthy? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, when we're looking at our emotional state, first of all is to be able to put a finger to it. What is it that you're feeling? For example, if you lose someone, then you feel sad. Are you able to say, this is how I feel? Because if you don't recognize how you feel, then you are not able to do anything about it. So the first step is to be able to recognize and to be able to be sure of that which you're feeling. I feel sad. And when I feel sad, what is it that I can do about it? Just like uh, Villa said, are you able to seek for support? So being aware of what we are feeling and even putting it down. For example, uh, all of us go through stuff at any time. The young people call it stuff. But I'm saying all of us experience some emotional distress at one point or the other. Are you able to recognize that feeling are you angry so if you're feeling angry you say i feel angry i feel annoyed i am hurt you're speaking to those particular words that you're feeling you're putting a finger to that which you're feeling because once you are aware then that's the beginning of healing you're only able to heal once you know and you are aware you recognize and you you accept what you're feeling. So even if you're alone at home, there's something that is disturbing you. Are you able to say, okay, this is how I feel. Sometimes we, 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 we ask that you write it down. When you write it down, you feel the exact thing that you're feeling. Because someone has annoyed you and you're writing down and, and, and you know you're reflecting on how you felt. How did that make me feel? What did I think about myself? Why would they have said this? So you're reflecting and you're able to process that feeling that you're going through and it helps you to, to heal. So it's important that when you recognize that there's something that is not going on right, that you take a step and do something about it. Because if you don't do something about it, then it stays with you. We believe that anything that is painful, we don't want to touch it. For example, if you have a wound, and you know for sure there is a wound, and you cover it, it does not mean that the wound is healed. It means it is there. So the painful aspects of our life, we pack them in the subconscious. Remember when you were young and someone told you something or something happened to you that was really painful, and it stays with you until such a time that you're able to process it. So when you cover it, it goes to the subconscious. Someone has been raped and they don't want to think about it, but it does not mean that it is gone. 
it still stays with you until such a time that you process it. So anytime you hear something has happened to someone, it affects you. Or your mother has died and you've never grieved over it. Anytime you hear someone has died, it's like your mother has died again, you know, and it stays with you. So what is it that we can do about it? Bring the unconscious to the conscious so that you are having it here and you're dealing with it. And the process can be very painful, but it's like sharpening iron. When you're sharpening iron or, you know, when gold is produced, it goes through fiery fineness, that it's going to be painful. The fire is hot and then it burns. And I remember in the morning, Sister Gladys talked about what, what walking on fire, but you're not consumed by the fire. So it's the same process. The process is painful, but at the end of it, it's beautiful, just like gold. So being aware of what we are feeling and taking action about it. If you can't do it on your own, you can reach out to someone. There is a support system in your friends, your relatives, you can see a counselor, but above all, being able to put a finger to it and starting that journey, because that's the beginning of healing. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Emily. We want to move to Rebecca, Sister Rebecca, and we, I want to ask you, what are the factors that contribute to living a healthy, emotionally healthy life? Um, thank you. It's, um, one of them is to listen to your interior in silence. Wait upon the Lord. There is power in silence. It is our opportunity to listen to the truth from God. It is an opportunity within which we can encounter the whispers of God. And adding some quiet time to our busy schedules may not be that easy. But however, there are benefits of um, creating time in getting away from the busy, no, uh, busy noises or the busy world that we live in. And one of them is when you go for exercises in the morning, quietly as you walk, you can talk to God to say, Lord, please tell me, guide me for the day. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do today? And you find that God will have time to whisper to you. And physically as well, taking time to be in a quiet place, it has some benefits. It's, it is said it lowers the blood pressure, it boosts the body's immune system, and it also improves the brain function. Actually, the world has embraced the issue of moving away from noises. Um, I'm not so sure about here, but, but where I come from, every year, when it is towards the end of the year, executives go out for a strategy seminar not within the building, not within the town. No, they go out in resort areas. Why? It's quiet. There is nature. And then when they come back, they have new plans for the company, for the companies to go forward. But however, as the children of God, whilst we know the benefits of all this, sometimes just take it for granted. No wonder Luke said in Luke 16 verse 8, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. I pray that may we take the opportunity every day to have a silent time to talk to the Lord in silence and listen to him talking to us. Uh, in terms of waiting, Psalm 62, verse 5 and 6 says, My soul waits for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, and I shall not be moved. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be They shall walk and not faint. Again, I would like to say, whilst it is difficult to find time
time to be silent and in a quiet place. It is good for our physical and emotional health. And God intends it to be like that. If you remember in um, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus used to wake up early in the morning while it was still dark, and he would go and pray. He had time to talk to God, and God would whisper to him what needs to be done for the day. Spending more time with God intentionally on a daily basis is necessary for Christ-centered lives. May God help us to create time so that we can just move apart and have the time to listen to God talk to us each and every day. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Sister Rebecca. As a mentor of many people, I'd like to ask uh, Sister Vane to take us through how we can be able to develop emotional intelligence. Thank you, thank you for that. If we want to develop our emotional intelligence, there are a few things that we need to look out for. We need to identify our emotions. Be sure of what they are and be in control of that. Why? Because if we are not in control of our emotions, it means that we might react badly, we might be stressed, something which maybe we'd have sorted. So it is important that we, we learn or we identify what they are. Let us control our emotions and knowing the emotions of others. You might think you are emotional, but maybe your neighbor is worse or is better or something like that. So it is important for us to know the people around us and what their emotions are. Somebody will always say, eh, uyo usimukaribie. Uyo umuchunge. So don't be that person. Know your emotions, know the emotions of those others. Manage your relationship with those you are with and Try to motivate yourself to achieve your goals so that you overcome what keeps lingering around you. That is what I can talk about in developing our emotional intelligence. It is a whole day's topic, but briefly, that is what I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Vin. I am told that our time is much spent, but we will allow for question from the audience as well as the online viewers. And as that is uh, being prepared, we will take two questions. As that is being prepared, um, I will ask um, our sister who had a testimony to come to the front. And as she is doing that as well, I will request Sister Emily and Sister Villa to quickly, in two minutes each, talk to us about living a transformed life, and forgiving yourself in two minutes each. I'd like to refer to two uh, verses in the Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, uh, which says... There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And also Galatians chapter 5 verse 13, which says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So we've um, talked broadly about self-awareness and... Um, I'd like to touch, as parents, we need to be self-aware. When you're self-aware, it means you know what has happened to you. You know, you know we have all sinned. We've all, we've all erred. So when we recognize that, we know we'll be ready to, you know, receive God's forgiveness and in turn be able to forgive. So even when you're parenting, because you're aware of that, we are careful as the way we are bringing up our children. So because we've accepted 
God's forgiveness, then we are now able to forgive ourselves. And in return, we are now able to issue the same forgiveness to others as well. Thank you so much, Sister Villa. Emily? Okay, um, first of all is to be able to recognize what the sin is and being able to surrender everything to God. Um, then secondly, to speak our emotions with scripture, whatever sin you've done, what is it that you know, what does the Bible say about it? So being able to speak um, through the use of scriptures and being able to confess and then turning your once you have already asked for forgiveness and you've confessed your sin to be able to put it into action and when we talk about putting it our putting our thoughts our everything in action it means putting god at the center of everything because god is love and he's forgiven us our sins so when we do recognize him as the god almighty the god who is overall the God who knows us, he knew us even before we were born and he knows our, our, he has plans for us and everything that we plan to do, he does know and he has already gone ahead of us. So being able to leave everything and having total surrender to him. We were taught about total, being able to totally surrender that yes, Lord, I have sinned and I've fallen short of your glory, but this is who I am and I come empty to you and surrender everything so that surrender is really important because it also glorifies god thank you thank you so much sister emily we have a testimony from marilyn osiemo and we kindly ask her to give her testimony in two minutes as we request if there is any question from the audience as well as the online viewers we will take two questions and then we will close. Sister Marilyn. Thank you. Um, happy Sabbath Church. So um, the last time I gave a testimony in front of such a huge congregation was about um, 16 years ago. So, um, and it is in line with what I want to share today. So um, we keep reading about um, um, what the Lord tells um, Joshua when he's about to take over from Moses um, and even the encouragement that Moses gave to Joshua that um, we can read from Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 which, which says and the Lord is the one who goes before you he will be with you he will not leave you nor forsake you do not fear nor be dismayed and then Jesus also tells us in um, John chapter 16, verse 33, that in the world you will face many tribulations, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. So um, what I want to share with us is that indeed in this world, we go through a lot of um, troubling times, tribulations, trials, all you see is just darkness. You don't know how you will actually be able to survive from that minute, not even that day. And I've gone through a lot of these situations. And over and over again, um, I've seen God being faithful. I've seen him showing his love to me. And my testimony from 16 years ago, um, I did my KCSC when... Uh, my dad had passed away. Actually, I got the news on uh, prayer day. The following day was rehearsals, and then Wednesday we were supposed to start the exams. So I got the news on that Monday. I just went home that Monday, went to see his body on Tuesday in the mortuary, and I was back in school on Wednesday to start the KCSC. And um, yes, it was a very difficult time, but as God has promised, that he's the one who goes before me, he will be with me, he will not leave me nor forsake me, therefore I should not fear nor be dismayed. And indeed, he led me through that period. Um, there were so many people praying for me, people from my church. I, my parents used to go to Jericho, 
So that's where I used to go. And uh, so people prayed for me, and I was able to overcome that. I excelled so much. Even the teachers who used to victimize me because I would go to church instead of class on Sabbath, one of them actually told me, now I, I believe in the God that you have been serving. And fast forward to um, the other day, one of our classmates from high school lost uh, a child. I was not able to go uh, to comfort with her, but one of my friends who went came and told me that, Mary, do you know um, it's been about 16 years since, your, um, since the loss you had, but when we went there, somebody just encouraged our friend that remember, if God was able to lead Meryl through that trying moment, how about you? And I understand that that lady was comforted. So it is 16 years later, but people are still able to um, testify of how they saw God lead me through my tough time. And um, as for this day, my work entails a lot of travel, and I still see God leading me, um, I still see him be with me. Sometimes I go through challenges. I am so far from home, so far from my husband who really encourages me. Uh, sometimes I'm in a different time zone. I'm not able to call him to even encourage me. Just the way David says, I looked for someone to, in Psalm 69 verse 20. I looked for someone to comfort me, but I could find no one. But because God has told us he will be with us, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He's the only one who comes through for me. In the middle of the night, when I'm crying, I'm not able to sleep. So um, in summary, I, I just want to say that um, our God who loved so much um, is faithful and since he has promised to be with us and to never leave us nor forsake us, um, this is what I want to leave us with. Um, as David says in Psalms 44 verse 1 to 3, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Because each day we go through battles, through wars, through tribulations. Um, but David confesses that God trains him for all this through the word that God gives us, through the songs that he puts in our hearts. Verse 2 says, My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you are mindful of him? So I just wanted to glorify God for his goodness as we have been learning the whole of this week about God's love. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Marilyn, for that powerful testimony. Indeed, uh, in the storm and in tough times, God is with us. And we have been taught that the only way to invoke the presence of the Lord is through prayer, through testimony, and through claiming his favor upon our lives. Um, our viewer and uh, church members, our program is quite elaborate and we may not be able to finish it this afternoon but we thank you for sitting and listening to us and um, we will just end with a parting shot from every um, member of the of, of the panel so uh, I'll start from uh, my left hand side and ask Sister Villa to give a parting shot of um, what we have learned through the week, what we have learned about loving God and loving ourselves. We've learned so much about transformational love uh, throughout the week by the speakers that we had. And so I want to encourage us that you are created in love and with joy by a joyful God who loves you. You are created to be joyful and loving, to be capable of giving and receiving love and to exercise your humanity and uniqueness. 
God has given you gifts, so you need to experience that without fear of rejection. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Vila. Sister Emily, what is your parting shot? Okay. Um, our key text was Matthew 22, verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And that basically tells us that in everything we do, we need to put God at the center of everything. And because God is love, when we do uh, put our everything on him, then everything that we put our hands to will come to, to a good end. And therefore, above all, let's love each other. Let's love God. Let's love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sister Rebecca, your parting shot. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to say, from what has been said throughout the week, and today and this afternoon, prayer is an essential element in our lives. We need to make it the, um, the front, the first defense line in our, li in, in our lives. May God help us to be prayerful people. May God help us to love one another. And may God help us to be always holding hands for those who are failing in life so that we can move together. Thank you so much, Sister Rebecca. Sister Veina, your parting shot. Men in the house, women in the house, children, youths, I invite you today to practice love. Practice loving yourself totally, loving your neighbor, it doesn't matter who, Love your God with all your heart and soul. Lay down your guilt, lay down your regrets, and your many issues, and pick up love. Love, love. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sister Vane. Our dear viewer, uh, my parting shot is um, if your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. If your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. And in a nutshell, what that means is you can never pour from an empty cup. Please fill your cup with God's love. Love yourself, forgive yourself, that you may be able to extend the same to your neighbor and to God. May God bless you all. As we close this session, I'd like to request Sister Rebecca to give us the final prayer. Shall we pray? Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves before you this afternoon, thanking you, Lord, for the word that has come to us. You spoke to us from the beginning of the week, Lord, until this time. Help us, Lord, to be doers of the word and not just listeners. Give us the strength, give us the willpower, Lord, to live as you desire in our lives. I pray for the young, I pray for the fathers, I pray for the mothers, and I pray for the church leadership. Help us to move together, Lord, and to love one another, and above all, to love you, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you are going to do for this church. May we feel the love each and every Sabbath going forward. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.